Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including A.B. Puppy, Dale Mulcahy, Matt Zaglin, and Charles Sylvie. On this episode of DTNS, France announces the details of its charges against Telegram CEO, a smartwatch with 48-day battery life, and some facts to help you understand the U.S.-China tech trade war better. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, August 27th, 2024. I'm in Los Angeles, and my name is Tom Merritt. I am also in Los Angeles at Studio Animal House, and my name is Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. But he won't tell you where he is. He could be anywhere. Nope. He could nope. be right behind you right now. You have no idea. Ah! Yeah. Roger, please. <laughs> Too much. Probably not behind you, but you never know. <laughs> you don't, it's always worth checking. Don't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look under your desk. You might have a Roger Chang doing a podcast there. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, it's now it's happened. We've been before. away for a week. It's good. It's <laughs> yeah. one of those. Days. I, I yeah. can neither confirm nor deny any of this. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's ex- <laughs> exactly right. Uh, yeah, we we got to talk about the Telegram stuff. So let's get right to the quick hits. Google has delayed the rollout of Android 15 until October, while it reportedly works to make it as stable as the company would like it to be. Pixel owners usually get an Android update first, but Pixel 9 owners will have to wait more than a month to get the newest operating system on the newest device. Google confirmed the delay in an info screen for Android beta users that read, if you're waiting for the Android 15 stable update, please ignore this OTA till Android 15 is available in October. Android Faithful's Michelle Rahman reported on Android Authority that a source told him Google will roll out the Android 15 update for Pixels sometime in the middle of October. Sources also tell Android Authority that Android 15 source code should come to developers next week. I like how Michelle also wrote, I hope I'm wrong about the middle of October. He's like, it could come it could come sooner. Please do. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> sources say this. I hope this is all just a big yeah. farce. You know? uh, in a letter to House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jim Jordan, Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg says he regrets caving into pressure from U.S. President Biden's administration to remove some COVID-19 posts that were humor or satire. Zuckerberg also said Meta, quote, shouldn't have demoted the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's laptop, which proved not to be misinformation. And he also said he won't be donating money to nonprofits to help operate elections in order to remain with the appearance of neutrality. Steam passed 37 million concurrent users on Sunday for the first time, surpassing the previous record of 36 million that was reached back in March. One of the big reasons of of the popularity of Tencent's Black Myth Wukong uh, cannot be understated. It launched on Steam on August 19th, becoming the second most played Steam game of all time and the most played game on Steam over the weekend. Researchers at Black Lotus Labs say they discovered attacks that began no later than June 12th on a tool called Versa Director. That's V-E-R-S-A. That is used by ISPs to do a lot of their complex network management. The attackers exploit the vulnerability to install a web shell that gives them remote admin control. That shell can run entirely in memory to avoid detection. The attackers then actively exploit the vulnerability through compromised small office and home office routers to capture ISP customer credentials. Versa has patched the vulnerability and distributed it to all of its customers. However, there's still evidence that it is being actively exploited even now. Last week, Microsoft wrote on a support page that the control panel is in the process of being deprecated in favor of the settings app. And several outlets reported that, okay, the control panel is finally going away after all these years. Well, Microsoft says not so fast. Over the weekend, it modified the page to instead say that many of the settings in Control Panel are in the process of being migrated to the Settings app. So, so Control Panel staying changes. with us. Yay. Yeah. 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 That and Program Manager. Who? No one wants to see them really leave, do they? No. I'm, I'm. <laughs> I love the Windows button. France's prosecutor of the Republic has published an explanation of the arrest of Telegram CEO Pavel Durov. This is what we were saying yesterday. We wanted to find out. We wanted to find out what are they actually charging him with? There are 12 charges being investigated. Uh, 
there was a press release. So we still haven't seen actual documentation, actual like legal language. Uh, but the press release says these are the 12 charges. Uh, they are related to an investigation that began July 8th. I've seen a lot of outlets say that uh, that the investigation is related to an unnamed person. I've also seen other outlets say that that's just what France typically does when it's a CEO of a company, because that way, if you swap out the CEO, it doesn't change <laughs> the, who you're going after. You can't get a, get away with it by going, oh, he's not the CEO anymore. Uh, so it may just be that they're after the CEO of Telegram, whoever he is. Uh, the charges, however, focus on complicity in the possession and distribution of pornographic images of minors, acquiring, transporting, possessing, offering, or selling narcotics, and offering some kind of malware or other cyber attack tool. Uh, those are the majority of them. They're complicity in these acts. So complicity means that Durov didn't do it, but he helped someone else who did. Uh, presumably the helping is being the CEO of Telegram and the person who did all these things used Telegram to do it. There's also well, a charge and, of- And help could be turning a blind eye, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. We did. We did Telegram. We didn't try to stop you. So we're complicit in helping you do it. But they're not saying Durov was out there distributing this stuff. Uh, there's also a charge of money laundering and uh, failure to properly file paperwork for its cryptography. Uh, the money laundering most likely comes from Telegram's own cryptocurrencies. The last month, Telegram launched something called Stars, which is a currency for buying digital content from other users. And you can convert Stars into Telegram's TonCoin cryptocurrency, which can be used for paid features on the platform. So, so you you know, when you can take real money, turn it into fake currency, which then can become a cryptocurrency, which then could become real money, you could see where somebody could use that for money laundering, potentially. Sure. So mm -hmm. yeah. again, the quest question is, did Durov know about this did, and turn a blind eye to it, like you were saying? Uh, there's also something called know your customer rules in most countries, including France, where if you are exchanging a large amount of money with someone, like turning it into cryptocurrency and back into real money, uh, you have to get their name, their government ID number, their tax information, stuff like that. Um, so it could be in violation of that, and that would be count as money laundering. Again, we don't know a lot of the details. We just know some. Uh Durov is still under arrest. The court can hold him for up to 96 hours. They did an extension, which makes it uh, that they can keep him for 96 hours before they formally indict him. That deadline will expire sometime Wednesday. Uh, after that, they either have to indict him or they could require him to stay in custody as a preventative measure against flight. Uh, if someone's a flight risk and a suspect in a crime, you can hold them then for longer than 96 hours. Durov lives in Dubai. He has multiple passports. So potentially that could be enough to convince a judge there's a flight risk. Um, what do you what do you what do you make of all of this now that we know a little bit more? We still don't know a lot of details, but we know a little bit more about what France is charging Durov with. Yeah. So and I know you and Shannon talked about this on the show yesterday what my my biggest uh th there are a lot of unknowns in the story my biggest question is can uh telegram not having true end to end encryption no so, so because of that reason a lot of things that are said uh privately aren't all that private can he claim well i just didn't know i yeah. didn't know I, because it and it, his whole sort of like billionaire playboy type thing that I don't think that plays into this directly, but it also reminds people that if you want something to be ironclad encrypted, you can. You can make it that way. What would be the reason that it is not that way? And, you know, is it uh, nefarious? Are you trying to leak information that's supposed to be under wraps, you know, to, you know, uh, state actors? I mean, those are conspiracy theories that are running wild right now. But I think the, the bigger question is, if you, if you don't let this be truly private, then it isn't. It certainly isn't. And then if things are happening that people can sniff out, well, who else does it fall on? Yeah, so so that that's a really good question, uh, you know, and 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 
the the facts of the case are uh, you can do end-to-end -end encryption on Telegram, as we talked about yesterday. You just have to actively do it, and it can only be for one-on-one -on -one chats. We didn't talk about the fact that it can be voice and video, but it can be for that too. But that means because it's not on by default, a lot of what happens on Telegram is not encrypted. Uh, so we still don't know. Are they saying... Our suspect was doing secret chats that were encrypted, uh, and because they're encrypted and you couldn't give them to us, you're in violation. That would be, we need a backdoor, and that would be very concerning for a lot of people. It doesn't seem like that's what's happening. It seems like they were saying, there were some unencrypted chats of this suspect going on on Telegram. We asked you to hand them over, and you didn't. So your question is pertinent, which is, well, hey, if Pavel Durov can access all the unencrypted information on Telegram, and lots of it is unencrypted, why wouldn't he cooperate? The things I could think of are, uh, it's too much. There's only 30 engineers, apparently, at Telegram, uh, and it, it may be impossible to track things down in a timely manner. Maybe they just miss deadlines. Uh, it's also possible well, that they Well, and isn't that also something that the company has been docked for? I mean, you can't possibly have true moderation with such a small team. Well, there's that's different too, right? There's a difference between the government saying, "Give us this information," and them saying, "We can't we can't get to it in time. It's it takes too much time to find it." And the government saying, "You need to shut down these chat rooms." And the company saying, oh, we don't really have moderators to do that, right? But those yeah. are similar. Those are similar situations. So it could be something like that, too. You're right. Um, I, I also think it could be you aren't, we don't recognize your authority to have this information. You know, the law enforcement may have phrased their request in a way that wasn't sufficient to convince Telegram that it had to comply. Uh, it may say like, you know, we don't need to comply. And that would come out in a court case where they would say uh, we were wrongfully arrested because we didn't cooperate, but we didn't need to cooperate. Legally, we didn't have to cooperate. And, you know, maybe you would have liked us to cooperate, but Telegram is very much the kind of company that's not going to cooperate unless they absolutely have to. Um, that's the problem with this this press release is that it doesn't go into those kinds of details. So we don't know what kind of information they're after. It does seem like they're not after Durov himself for anything. They are after him for being the CEO of a platform that was hosting either a person or a group of persons who are engaged in, in criminal distribution of child pornography, uh, narcotics, and uh, cyber attack, you know, malware, et cetera, uh, and that they didn't, they didn't cooperate. Could be more than one group, uh, give, given that range of, of criminal, you know, maybe there's a group for each one of these things, and Telegram didn't cooperate in, in trying to police them and trying to track them down. Yeah. Yeah, uh, very interesting question about, well, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is an option for you, not on by default, and therefore we're offering users choice. In many ways, that is how a platform should behave. But when it comes to, well, turning a blind eye or, you know, or worse, um, is now a question about your character specifically, then that's, that's a... Uh, I don't know. I, I mean, how this shakes out, I think, is is going to determine how a lot of other platforms operate. I'm I'm concerned if the information thereafter was encrypted. Was it was end encrypted? If it was part of a secret trap. I get I get very concerned about that. Same way I did about the FBI trying to get information out of Apple, you know, years ago. Uh, if it becomes we wanted them to hand over this information in good faith and they didn't. I am going to have to learn about French law along with a lot of other people to understand, well, what should they had to have done and what didn't they? And we, mm -hmm. we are not near getting that level of detail uh, from, from the French government as yet. So I'll just wait to form my opinion about this. I, I go with what I said at the end of yesterday's conversation, though. It's extremely bold and significant that they arrested the CEO. They didn't fine him. They didn't bring him in for questioning and let him go. They arrested him and held him for 96 hours. So the agencies behind this who are, you know, fighting uh, child-oriented uh, crimes, uh, so cl clearly the child pornography aspect of this, uh, and, and wider uh, criminal organizations uh, are after somebody big and didn't think Durov was taking them seriously. So now he has to. Uh, 
Let's move on from those criminal topics and talk about <laughs> smartwatches uh, because that's more because fun. Because not all criminals wear smartwatches. <laughs> no. But, uh, <laughs> but all watches are criminals? No, that's not right. <laughs> I either. don't know. Yeah, I was trying to do that too. Uh, so Garmin Ooh. introduced a couple new smartwatches. They're, they're rugged. Um, they're also kind of expensive, but they do some fun stuff. So here are the specs for the Fenix 8. It has both a speaker and a mic, so if you choose the solar display instead of the OLED display, battery life can last between 29 and 48 days. Days, not hours, days. But it's going to cost you $1,000. The Enduro 4 uh, has an LED flashlight and solar charging that it can extend, uh, extend battery life up to 320 hours in GPS mode. That one is $900. So both of these watches are available now. They are expensive. Um, but uh, as a smartwatch enthusiast, and so many things about my watch are, you know, a part of my person at this point, uh, battery life like this is insane. Yeah. Just to and not have to think about it for a month type thing. These these are obviously not doing the same things that a Google Watch or an Apple Watch are doing. Uh, they're not trying to be right. as multi-purpose. They're very, very suited to, you know, GPS mode means tell me where I am <laughs> and that's it. Don't don't play Spotify on my watch or anything like that. They do have the Garmin messaging, which is both cool and not cool on the one hand. The person you're talking to also has to have the Garmin messaging app, but anybody can get it. I don't know if it's end to end encrypted. No, not that you <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm uh, lost. And eh, well, but, you know, it's but not encrypted. You can, I'm not you can you. use voice and video on the Garmin messaging app from your watch, from the Phoenix 8, right? And you don't have to have a phone paired to it. You can just, you know, talk to somebody. That That's pretty cool. Um, yeah. And I the solar power, like the solar charging of these is pretty cool, too. Totally. I, yeah, I think sometimes, I mean, listen, if you're a Garmin enthusiast, you're going to be like, no, this is great. I, you know, I either have the money to spare or I don't, but I know what I'm getting. You know, it's rugged. It's designed to be, you know, outdoors, you know, you, uh, splash proof, you know, all the things that other watches are getting better at, but still, you know, my Apple watch is sort of a precious little device. It's not really supposed to be like a triathlete, no. but, but also, sometimes I think that Garmin and there's some other companies like Garmin do themselves a disservice by only marketing to this like, oh, you got to be like, you know, you're in the, the, the I don't know. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, you're lost in the Grand Canyon. You know, this is the kind of watch that you should have. Yeah. That's true. But also just regular folks to have uh, really good battery life, to have solar capabilities, to have messaging capabilities, you know, with people that you want to get a hold of. Not everybody needs that, oh, it's a computer watch type thing. I mean, I do. Yeah. That's what I want. But, but I think the activity watch is still a, a really interesting market. I think it's smart for, for Garmin to, to position themselves uh, in this way. Uh, Garmin has that brand already uh, for, for years before it ever made smartwatches. But, but to say, you know, yeah, Apple, you've got your, your take on a durable watch uh, the, with the Ultra. We live there. That's what all of our watches are. All of our watches are durable. All of our watches are are meant for hikers, uh, meant for outdoors enthusiasts and triathletes and all of that. And if you go to REI, expect to see a Garmin watch there. You're not necessarily going to see an Apple watch. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. I don't know. I haven't looked. Uh, but I, I think that has kept Garmin uh, you know, separated in people's minds rather than being, well, why would I get that? I could just get an Apple watch, which I, I think has sunk a few other watchmakers in the past. Yeah, for sure. I, I was just talking uh, about how much I like my Apple Watch to Eileen Rivera on Apple Vision Show that we recorded yesterday, a new episode out now. And, you know, I was like, it's it's the it's the perfect thing. I never take it off except first thing in the morning when I have to charge it because I do wear it overnight. You know, all that is great. But yesterday I took my dog out on a hike Hadn't really thought about the fact that I was going to use it a little bit more and kind of be tracking activity more than I might on a Monday afternoon. And it went to sleep before I got back to my car. Now, my phone was with me, so it's like, yes, my steps were still tracked. I can sync them. Kind of a hassle, not a big deal. But going back to that, 
oh, not thinking about charging my battery for the better part of a couple of months, that is huge. And that it's not just because like you're in the wilderness, you know, without power for, you know, 48 days. It's more of just this, oh, it just works for so much longer that we don't have to do these somewhat silly patterns of, among, you know, our days that, we all do yeah. right now because we have no choice. And again, it, it is a trade-off. It's a different kind of watch than you're going to get from Apple, but uh, but no. the solar power really does extend it. Uh, and the the you know the limited again, you're not doing the OLED screen. Phoenix Eight has an OLED screen option. It's not going to get 29 days of battery life though. Uh, so you got to right. be doing one of those solar screens. But yeah, those are uh, those are those are uh, those are very smart and compelling features from the old Garmin there. Uh, Indeed. If you've got thoughts about your favorite smartwatch feature or your favorite smartwatch or just being smart, uh, you can talk about it in our Discord. Join our conversation by linking a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. A couple of stories popped up today that I think uh, we can do something that DTNS does that not a lot of other folks do, which is link them together to help advance your understanding of an ongoing story. So these aren't breaking news necessarily, but uh, you probably do know that there's a bit of a trade war brewing. Eh, it's not brewing, it's brewed. There's a bit of a trade war steaming in a hot mug <laughs> between China and the United States. Uh, we cover mostly on this show the United States side of it because the United States has been taking most of the action in restricting what technologies, what chip making technologies, and what actual chips can be supplied to Chinese technology companies. Uh, and this has impacted the bottom lines of places like NVIDIA and TSMC. Not that they're not doing well, but they've had to adjust and say, well, we could have sold a lot more to China if we were allowed to, but we're not allowed to. So we have to make different things. The idea is that the United States is trying to slow down the advance of certain technologies, particularly around AI in China. That has caused companies in China to get very inventive uh, and try to come up with new ways of creating chips. Now, some of them are just developing their own designs. Uh, but if you've listened to know a little more, you may have heard our episode on RISC-V. RISC-V is an open standard of an instruction set for chips that is administered by a Swiss organization. So it is not subject to to U.S. rules. It is entirely open, so people can use it for whatever they want. And a Hong Kong-based company called Deep Computing announced a tablet, the DC Roma RISC-V Pad 2 tablet running Ubuntu using the SpaceMIT Keystone K1 system on a chip, uh, the same chip that this company, Deep Computing, uses in its RISC-V laptop. So now they have a laptop and a tablet. Tablet starts at $149, has four gigs of RAM. Uh, and specifically, this instruction set not subject to US restrictions. So it has become another option for Chinese technology companies to take advantage of. Um, yeah, Sarah, I'm not I'm not saying this is the biggest advance making this tablet, but it just shows that Hong Kong, you know, uh, a, a Chinese main, you know, it's not Chinese mainland, but it's a it's Chinese territory uh, subject to a lot of these restrictions has a company that's like, we're going to keep making risk five stuff. And if they keep making risk five stuff, they'll get better at it and they'll make risk five better, which is actually better for the entire world because risk five is available for anybody worldwide. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, great way to get around uh, a variety of restrictions. Is there a world where the U.S. could say, well, OK, too many of these are being sold and we got to clamp down on them? <sighs> I don't think so. I mean, not that they wouldn't try if they thought they could, uh, but the, the RISC-V technology is, is all patent-free. Uh, it's an open standard. It was developed at Berkeley, uh, but they moved the organization to Switzerland specifically to avoid any kind of entanglements with <laughs> the, the United States or be. EU. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, huh. Roger, do you have, do you have something about RISC-V before? Because I've got another yeah. example here that's on the other side of the table. Uh, real quick, it's like this is really interesting. Um, it, it remains to be seen one if it's a commercial success, uh, but two, 
while the instruction set is important, really for for China, it's getting access to those technologies that allow them to do the higher precision lithography to allow them to make the higher end chips locally in the same way that we're paying or uh, subsidizing TMC, TSMC in the U.S. to build their fabrication plants. And and I stress, uh, not at the same uh, level at, as they can produce locally in Taiwan. So it's... Um, it is. It is a very. It is more of a sign of their intentions on where they want to go uh, to circumvent these yeah. uh, restrictions. It's a step on the path. It's not the arrival, right? Yeah. Uh, they are making advances in lithography separate to this, uh, but this is another one to keep an eye on. Uh, so yeah, this isn't the news, right? To me, this is something people can remember and go, well, there are Chinese companies or Hong Kong company in this case making Risk Five laptops or Risk Five tablets. So it's another piece. It's another yeah. piece in that puzzle. The puzzle isn't done yet. Um, there are also, you know, the equivalent of blowing the puzzle off the table, right? That's that's the retaliation side of this. Uh, China has begun reducing its exports of germanium and gallium, uh, two materials that are used in making semiconductors. Uh, two materials, I would say, are essential in making semiconductors. They're also essential in making a lot of other technology, LEDs, infrared, night displays, things like that. China supplies 98% of the world's gallium and 60% of its germanium. China introduced restrictions on those last year, they're saying, in order to safeguard national security. Same thing the U.S. says when it's restricting export of its chip technology. An unnamed source at a Western chip maker told the Financial Times that if China reduces gallium exports as it did in the first half of the year, then our reserves will be consumed and there will be shortages. Which uh, would mean that yeah. the things will get more expensive, which it, I think it, is, you know, it means that, you that's have, the concern for a lot of the you know, end users. You won't right? be able to make the parts that go into the electronics that you want to buy, which, yeah, will then drive up the price. Yeah, it's the PS5. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's it remember the chip shortage from, you know, that was a logistics caused chip shortage because we we pulled down factory production during, you know, yeah. thinking there wouldn't be demand and the demand went up faster than than we could catch up. This would be a China created shortage where yeah. you just can't get all of the minerals that you need. Uh now Roger, when we were prepping for the show, you pointed out that China doesn't even have natural deposits of these minerals it's just where they're processed and it's, that's why they have the the stranglehold on it so well so china does have a local supplies it has 60 percent of the world's germanium but it doesn't have all of them and so this is one of those issues where you know they can't push too hard because short term it's going to hurt everyone that produces electronics uh, but long term, what that does is incentivizes uh, other companies to look outside and develop new uh, new sources for these for these rare earths, uh, including the processing, which is super important. Right? Uh, you know, uh, bauxite is the the ore where we get uh, aluminum, but also gallium from. It's a byproduct of aluminum uh, production, and China is the largest aluminum producer in the world. So a byproduct of that is a lot of uh, gallium. Um, but when Australia sends it, sends out the, the, the ore. It doesn't actually process it down. China does that. And so, you know, we could get these, we could get these sources elsewhere, but we don't have the, the processing capability right now to do it at scale the way China does. And that is one of those things that, again, will hurt short to medium term, but long term, it just incentivizes people. It's like, all right, why don't we build a factory in this location? Why don't we build a processing in this location? You'll lose efficiency because China's built this amazingly tight uh, 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 supply chain in, uh, internally to provide all their manufacturers all the things they need. And that would be harder to reproduce Oh, you know, as you spread it across the globe, but it is it, it would definitely be one of the things at the top of mind uh, for companies as well as countries if this gets uh, and that will also make things more expensive. Yeah. Uh, so so what what we're facing here is a slow motion game of chicken <laughs> where the United States is like, we're not going to give you the best chips, but keep making stuff for us for cheap. And China's yeah. like, mm, all right. 
that's fine, know. but we we're not going to slow let, down things on our side. We're not going to let you have all of the minerals, yeah. you know. And so China's trying to build up its lithography and its chip making ability so it doesn't rely on U.S. tech, uh, while the rest of the world is trying to figure out other ways of processing the ores and other sources of, of these minerals of these rare earths. Uh, that none of that happens fast. No. So it's, it's it's a very slow motion, you know, game of like, who's going to blink first? Who's going to say, well, you know what? Uh, maybe we should come to an agreement. Because if you don't, that efficient process that Roger was just talking about is no longer going to be what is used, meaning things are less efficient, meaning the price of everything goes yeah. up. It's good because be. it's more complex to make everything. So, yeah, uh, save your save your money now. <laughs> Planning the upgrade. It, it's not a it, again. I I, tr I tried to set this up as this isn't the news. Yeah. This isn't the alarm yeah. bell. Everything's falling it, apart. This well, is. Well, but it, these are all components and what might yeah. be an interesting news story sooner than later. This you're is, not going to use this information today, but down the road you're going to be like, well, I remember that you know China yeah. does do a lot of the processing of these, these rare are minerals. All yeah. pieces on a chessboard that are exactly. just being played yeah. over a, a very long period of time that you need to keep an eye on. Yep. Uh, and if you want to understand when something suddenly does happen later, you could be the one who's like, oh, yeah, no, we knew this was coming because there was this slow motion game of chicken happening. So, all right, before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Sergey writes, I really enjoyed the in-depth talk on Monday about Telegram and how it's not encrypted by default as one would expect. However, one thing I haven't seen mentioned is how does Telegram make money or at the very least pay its bills? Well, it has recently added a premium subscription and in some places ads. From what I can tell, none of it is enough to cover expenses, including an unlimited cloud storage service it offers for free to users. Yeah, um, this is an interesting question, Sergey, and I think I know where you're coming from, uh, which is, are they getting secretly funded by someone, perhaps someone France doesn't like? Uh, and maybe that's not where you're coming from, but I know a lot of others are, are suspecting that. Uh, we don't know how Telegram's balance sheet looks because they're not a public company and they don't have to tell us. We do know who's been investing with them. There's been a lot of suspicion about them hiding investors, but there hasn't been evidence that they've done that. Otherwise, the things you mentioned, premium subscriptions, the cryptocurrency, the stars stuff we talked about, uh, along with charging businesses to reach their customers directly on Telegram, which is something WeChat uh, also does and makes a lot of money off of doing. Uh, it may not look like that's enough to, to pay their bills. And maybe it's not, but it also might be. Uh, and, and when you're talking about a startup, you know, which Telegram still is in a lot of ways, uh, you can lose money for a lot of years and your investors are fine with that as long as the trajectory is headed the way they want to go. So even if they're not making money right now, they may be on their way to making money. I guess the interesting thing about Telegram, Sarah, is that they are still independent. They are still, they have not been gobbled up by somebody else the way a WeChat or a WhatsApp or others have. Well, yeah, and I think uh, a lot of uh, <laughs> people who are uh, in, uh, who are used to traditional investment is like, who's going to buy Telegram? Uh, you know, Telegram, uh, if you've got enough private funding, not secret funding necessarily, but just reasons to stay afloat for the foreseeable future, you don't really care about that. I mean, not every company has that luxury, right? You know, you have to you have to hire. Uh, you know, uh, make uh, make your payments from, you know, rounds of venture capital investment and that sort of thing. Um, it sounds like in many ways, Telegram is operating outside of the norms. Not that, again, Telegram is doing something uh, wrong on purpose, but operating in a way that uh, raises some questions. Yeah. Uh, but there is no evidence that there's anything untoward or even unusual. Uh, it, it, it is not particularly unusual. There is the cryptocurrency of it all, which Telegram says it makes a lot more money out of than you might have expected. And some people are suspicious of that. Um, so it's one of those things where it's like a Rorschach test. You can see whatever you want. It's, it's a murky enough picture that you can look yeah. at it and go, I don't know, it looks sus to me. Uh, and you're not wrong, well, but, but you're also, also not like right. Some, some people say like, well, crypto is just sus. And it's like, well, no, it isn't. Not yeah. theoretically. And, and it, 
I mean, often it, it can is. be, but that's, <laughs> you know, that, you know, it's how it's, but used. it is, a, right. it, 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 there is nothing on the face of this that couldn't be explained in a perfectly legitimate and on its way, if not already making money kind of way. I mean, there, there are enough ads and enough premium subscribers and they keep their costs low. They have a very small staff, um, that they could very well be, be, be making money. So I'm, I'm not looking at that and, and saying, aha, there, there's something suspicious about how they make money. It looks fairly mundane to me as, as these tech companies go. Well, uh, September 10th, September 9th. <laughs> Ooh, look at me. Uh, I should know this, uh, is, uh, <laughs> is where we're getting new iPhone announcements and Apple vision show is gearing up for new iPhones and Apple watches. And this is my personal request, please. New Mac minis. We thought it was September 10th until yesterday. So check out our latest episode. It was a fun one. And thank you for subscribing at applevisionshow.com. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. TikToker Keith Lee is in trouble for not reviewing DC restaurants. We're going to talk about the curse of being a TikTok celebrity. Everybody loves you until they suddenly don't. Mm -hmm. You can catch our show live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. That's 2000 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back doing it all again tomorrow with Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>